So welcome back, welcome back to the, to the session. This is a panel session uh, on the topic of innovation, climate change and the bioeconomy. Uh, in a way, this is very much a follow up uh, of the previous presentation. And I think whatever was the topic, there will be many inspiring thoughts coming from the previous discussion that we'll come back to. Uh, we, we, we should have four uh, participants to this panel, but at the moment, for different reasons, we only have two on the stage. So we start with the two we have. Um, David, of course, doesn't need much introduction, I guess. I will just introduce uh, Christian uh, that came, uh, that came uh, today or yesterday uh, with all these problems on, <laughs> with transport. Is founder and managing director of the Toulouse School of Economics Research of Economics. Uh, topics of research: uh, uh, economics of uncertainty, environmental economics, finance, insurance, cost-benefit analysis, with particular interest in long-term sustainability effects. So I think many competencies actually complementary with uh, what we have. I will start right away. Uh, uh, we don't have presentation. I will ask each of you to take 10-12 minutes for a. Uh, uh, speech uh, um, on the topic of the panel and then we can come back with questions or um, discussion. We agree that David will go first, so please the floor is yours. Okay. It's, good. it's a pleasure to be here and it's really great to speak after uh, uh, Professor uh, Rogers. Now, what I'd like to do is to provide a little bit of a background, and I'll start with, a, with some, with, with what really brought me to some of uh, the point that I brought, that I'm uh, mentioning today. Oh, anyone, everyone knows that we have three or four big crises, climate change, population growth, loss of biodiversity, rural income. And there, was a, there is a big debate about the future of agriculture. So we had something, and I'll speak later on about it, called the UN World Food uh, System Summit. And I was one of the three economists in the summit. The other were uh, medical doctors, nutritionists, etc. And before the summit, I was flooded with about maybe 700 emails from people that were in the ag agroecology movement. And I realized that the key challenge of the world when it comes to agriculture is what type of agriculture you have. And three, there are three visions. One vision that I caricature uh, that is a little bit uh, uh, extreme is the European vision. Agroecology, organic farming, 25% uh, of organic, not using, for example, not using uh, palm oil. Uh, Basically, if agriculture that is a little bit more minimalistic will feed the people of Europe, but will be pure. This is one approach. I call it maybe back to the past. Another approach is the American approach that I can call it a food plus. Namely, using say, the way that it's done today, you can use the biotechnology for fiber and for animal feed, not so much for food, and let everything be the same. The third approach is what I call the bioeconomy, and obviously I am uh, supportive of it. And the basic uh, idea is that if we use modern uh, agricultural technologies or modern biotechnology, and as well as modern information technologies, et cetera, in agriculture, we can double the amount of uh, feedstock that we can produce very easily. And we can produce biofuel, biochemical, and we move from a, no, from a non-renewable economy to a renewable economy. So that's basically the premise of what I want uh, to say. Now, I was really surprised that most of the members of the Science Advisory Board were following this perspective. And another thing that is very interesting, there are two very distinguished economists, the, Pardee and Alston that write all the time papers on estimating the productivity of agricultural production. And they noted that the productivity of agriculture went down. And of course, what the reason the reason the government doesn't give us a lot of money for research. They never ask the question, there is a lot of research going on, but we don't approve it. What good is it 
to have this fantastic knowledge of biology that you that can produce vaccines and other things when you cannot use the result. So I really think that today we uh, we enter an era that we that we enter an era where we have a lot of knowledge, we have a lot of tools, and we don't use it. Now, at the same time, we have the problem of climate change. Now, we had big success stories. Solar energy, wind power, these are great. Now, being in Berkeley, I was uh, in charge on assessing the supply chain of hydrogen for shell oil. And I worked with several iterations of people that tried to work on the hydrogen economy. Even uh, our governor, uh, previous governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger, wanted to have the hydrogen highway. It didn't work for several reasons. It didn't work because producing hydrogen is tough, moving hydrogen is tough, and sending the vehicle uh, system to use hydrogen is difficult. And when you speak with people that really know a little bit about transportation, they say that in the West, maybe in 30 years, we we'll move to electric car completely. But what about truck? What about airplane? What about India? So to some extent, we can have agriculture that is much bigger than food if we use biotechnology. Now, we have about six or seven traits that are being used, maybe 10. In my very partial assessment, we, I know about more than 200 traits, I have a survey that, had it, that has several of them, that were not used because of regulation. Now, the regulation is very simple. No one tells you, you no. People tell you, we need more study and we will approve it next year. If you are in finance, why would you support projects like this? Now, there are a lot of traits that can be used. Some people, some people in Illinois develop a new, a new trade that accelerates 40%, that increases the productivity of photosynthesis by 40%. We have a, a, lot of, a, a lot of biofuel from miscanthus and other products that are extremely effective. Sugar cane, even uh, it's very effective in productive biofuel, even though <laughs> In Brazil, Petrobras doesn't like it very much because they make more money from selling oil. So <clears throat> the possibility of using agricultural production to replace, <clears throat> to replace a fossil fuel, a non-renewable product is huge. My view is that we are now entering the, basically the biology era. While in the past, most of the technologies that we have originated from, from physics. Now we have incredible capacity in biology that can allow us to move to a renewable economy. The big issue is regulation. And now I think, and I think a big reason is politics. I don't worry about acceptance. I did more than 10 studies and always you see that more than 60% of the population, no matter what, maybe except Japan, will buy whatever is on the shelf if it's available. So the big issue is the politics and the political economy. But to me, the issue of biotechnology, and I don't speak about GMO, Bi biotechnology is CRISPR and CRISPR will have sons and daughters and grandchildren. It's only the beginning. If we don't take advantage of these technologies, we wouldn't be able to solve the food problem, but more importantly, we wouldn't be able to solve uh, the climate change problem. So it's not, so it's the interest of Europe to start really move, uh, moving to a system like what we did with the pandemic, that you allow new solutions to enter as fast as it can, as they come. Now, the last thing that I would li uh, like to say, the greatest thing about Dr. Fauci was when he was working on AIDS, he basically decided that when you have a crisis, you try the solutions while they are hot and Take some risk and learn from your experience. That's the way that Microsoft is doing. That's the way that any industrial process is doing. That would really allow us to have solution to aid. That would really allow us to have the vaccine. And that's what we should do with biotechnology. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I like it. Uh, I like it very much so far. Um, I learned a lot. Um, 
so so let me let me pursue uh, on the main idea that was developed uh, by David and also by by Richard earlier this this morning. Uh, we need science. We need more science. Uh, uh, so and and here I want to talk about climate change specifically. I'm not. Uh, that's my field of specialty. Uh, <clears throat> So we know, we all know, I mean, and it's, and it's science, we know that we have a climate change problem that is generated by your emissions of CO2 and other greenhouse gases. Um, but the, so there is a consensus there, at least in Europe. Uh, but, 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 but in Europe, as everywhere else, there is no consensus at all about how to reorganize society uh, to make it uh, able to uh, reduce emissions and face our responsibilities toward future generation. And there we also need science. And, and, and to say the least, I mean, <laughs> in the media, uh, there is no much, no much things like, you know, let us see what social scientists have to say about how to reorganize society to make sure that we can reduce our emissions of CO2. Uh, you know that among economists and academics, uh, academic economists, there is, there is a, a strong consensus, like in biology, there is a consensus on GMOs. In economics, there is a consensus about how to solve the problem. Okay, the solution of the problems will come from, I mean, valuing CO2 or pricing CO2. Uh, and and let, let's try for each action to compare the cost per ton of CO2 saved with the value of carbon reduction, carbon emission. Um, uh, and so there are two questions there. How to value the cost, I mean, how, how do we measure the cost per ton of CO2 of a specific action? Let us consider the possibility to introduce a new GMOs that uh, would increase the, the, the intensity of uh, photosynthesis by plants. Uh, 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 that, we, that, that may have some cost, net cost, and, and that may be difficult because there are, and I will come back later on that, there, are, there may be several cost benefit, co benefits and other impacts, uh, positive or negative, to, to the environment and to, and to health and to, I mean, price of products and things like that. So, so this specificity of, in particular, in the agroforestry of how to measure the cost per ton of CO2 save may be difficult. And there is this other question, how do we value, how society value uh, an action that reduce emission by one ton of CO2, for, for example. And so on this, specific, on this specific question, what's the value of carbon? Uh, I, that's my field. I, mean, I, I wrote several papers and books on that. Uh, when you know we have a Nobel Prize uh, winner on this, William Nordos, who tried over the last 30 years to produce a model uh, that generates information about uh, when you emit one ton of CO2 today, what's the consequence uh, for society in the future? And so there is a flow of marginal damage, climate damages that you can discount in order to determine what's the present value of, this, of those damages, uh, to, and that would be the carbon price. Uh, in, in an approach based on the polluter pay principle, we should ask everyone to pay uh, for the damage that, that you generate by polluting the atmosphere. You know that the answer to, uh, pro provided by, by, by Bill on this is uh, something like 50, 60 dollars per ton of CO2. And, and, but at the same time, you also probably know that, that if you price at that level, that will not be enough to limit increased temperature by two degrees Celsius. And under the model, uh, we, we believe that uh, this price growing at two or three percent per year uh, will imply that we will emit such amount of CO2 that will make the average temperature to increase by at least three degrees Celsius by the end of this century. So we need a larger carbon value a larger carbon price if we, uh, if we want to, uh, to, to attain this politically determined objective for the two degrees Celsius. 
And my understanding, when I look at those numbers and I put my own numbers, uh, my own calibrations in, in those models, I get a price like something uh, 160 euros per ton of CO2. And of course, at that value, uh, uh, so, so compatible, for example, with reducing emission by 55% by the end of this decade, um, so, so this value of carbon give you an idea of the intensity of the challenge we face globally. Uh, so indeed, most of the biofuel, for example, will pass the test of a, posit uh, pass a, test of a, of a positive net present value. On top of that, we have this, uh, Justice wants us to, to speak about the Ukraine crisis. Uh, on top of this uh, 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 carbon, I mean, uh, climate change problem, we have the current price of oil and gas, on, in particular in Europe, which is very high. Uh, the, the price of gas has been multiplied by a factor 16 since, since over the last one year and a half. So of course, that's good news for the development of biofuels. Uh, and, in, and of course, uh, that's the consequence of the fact that we bear a moral responsibility to reduce the financing of the Russian army currently uh, working in, in Ukraine. And, and we are current, currently find, funding this aggress, aggression in Ukraine by purchasing uh, at that very large price oil and gas from Putin. Okay, so biofuels. Uh, this summer, I mean, probably it's too late, huh? but, uh, but uh, there is an additional social value to use biofuels this summer and probably next year too, because the crisis will last for probably a longer time. Uh, biofuels has an additional value uh, on, on top of the one that I presented earlier. Uh, but the problem, of course, is that this argument is only temporary. Hopefully, uh, price of oil and gas will go back uh, to their original level and, and probably even going down in the long run, because if we really become serious about uh, fighting climate change, our demand for, uh, for oil and gas will go to zero. And, and the oil rich country will, will understand that and will try to sell their, their reserves before it's too late. And that will have a depressive effect on, on, on price of, of oil and gas. So, so be prepared of uh, a competition between your technologies and the, and, the, and the will of those oil rich countries, oil and gas rich countries to, to sell their product before it's, it's too late. So, so that's not really a good news in that, in that dimension. So, uh, but of course, I mean, there is, I'm not a specialist there, but uh, my understanding is that we are still learning about the real cost per ton of CO2 save of these biotechnologies. We will learn more in the future. And it's not clear whether biofuel will, will beat other possibility of decarbonizing the, our economy. Okay, I, I'm, I'm, li I'm living in Toulouse uh, and I'm a board member of an uh, institute called the Institute for Sustainable Aviation. So in, you know that in aviation sector, uh, the problem of decarbonization is critically important and, uh, and the, probably the, the, I mean, the, the most promising technologies is bio, bio, using biofuel for, uh, for flying, uh, for, for flying uh, airplanes. Uh, so, so, but, but there, is comp there are competing uh, technologies going on these days. We, we don't know who will be the winner in 20 or 30 years from now. So, so in, given those uncertainties about who will be the winning technology, we need two things. First, we need, uh, we need a portfolio. Okay, we need to diversify risk. Uh, and we need to, uh, so, so we need at the same time to develop bio, biotechnologies. We also uh, ex need to explore capture and sequestration. We need to explore uh, sol uh, future solar and, and wind electricity and the possibility to electrify uh, mobility in res residential sectors. How we will do that in the future, that's not very clear. Currently, uh, those technologies are, remain very expensive, and that's raised the question of at what speed, at what speed we should decarbonize our, our economies in Europe. Um, <clears throat> so those uncertainties imply that when you know we know how to manage risk, we manage risk by diversifying those risks. So we need at the same time to invest in nuclear technologies, in renewable energies, uh, in biofuels, and etc. 
um, yes, and, and, and on top of that, uh, because uh, this R&D process generate positive externalities, we know that carbon pricing and the promise of a high carbon price in the future will not be enough to provide the right incentive to the innovators <laughs> to perform the, 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 the innovation we will need in order to combine fighting climate change and ma making it uh, socially acceptable. Okay, at the current cost of decarbonizing our societies, there is a clear, very, very, very important uh, political and social acceptability problem. So we need, we need to reduce those costs. And the way to do that is to do, to do a lot of R&D in all those potential technologies. And, to, and in order to provide the right incentive on top of carbon pricing and a promise of high carbon price in the future, we also need to provide uh, subsidies to R&Ds. And, and we have seen that in the US, we have seen that in Europe in particular, since the beginning of the COVID crisis uh, with the European plan and also national plans to invest in, in those technologies. Let me end up with, um, with the issues of uh, specifically measuring um, measuring cost in, in your sector, in biotechnologies, in agriculture and forestry. Okay, clearly, clearly um, uh, I mean, those sectors are the black hole of carbon pricing, okay? And, and for different reasons. Okay, one reason is measurement. I mean, we don't know, I mean, it's not clear how to measure uh, how much a farm uh, emit of CO2, so it's very difficult to, to determine, for example, how much, uh, how many permits of CO2 emission the farmer should have to purchase in order to uh, to to, um, to incentivize him to decarbonize. So, so measurement is a problem, in particular the problem of, of additivity. Okay, in forestry, when you when you decide not to to cut a tree. Uh, you may just decide to cut the other tree. And so, so there is a clear uh, additivity problem, in particular when you think about uh, the, the price effect of, uh, of reducing uh, the production of, uh, of some agricultural product. So that's one problem. The other problem is, as you know, you are the specialist, the complexity of natural systems. Those systems are so complex that it's very difficult to estimate the entire set of impacts of your actions. And therefore, it's very difficult to measure, to perform a cost-benefit analysis of, of those different actions. Uh, <clears throat> there is, of course, this, also these issues of competing uh, land use. And the fact that if you expand a lot biofuels and bio, bio diesel and, and all the, that kind of, uh, of, of, of technologies, you will reduce the uh, land availability for to produce food. And we know that we have a food problem in particular, uh, given the current uh, crisis in Ukraine. The issue of risk is also very important. We don't know today the long-term consequence of those technologies. Uh, so, uh, as we said, as I exchanged with Richard earlier in this morning, there is, uh, there is a difficulty. I mean, there are option value to wait. How do we measure those option values? Just as a specialist, um, uh, that's, uh, that's a technical problem we need to, uh, uh, to examine in details in order to perform those, um, those, um, those measurements of the cost of, uh, of green, green actions in the, in the sectors of agric agriculture and forestry. And at the end, we also have uh, uh, co-benefits that are, the, well, I, I almost said that already, uh, co-benefits and in, indirect costs associated with those, those actions that are difficult to measure. So the consequences in those, for those biotechnologies linked to uh, natural systems, agriculture, forestry, carbon pricing will probably not the most efficient way to incentivize uh, those, uh, the market player there. So as a consequence, uh, we need to consider other climate policies. Uh, so norms is a possibility, for example, imposing a minimum of bioethanol in, in the, 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 uh, the, the uh, gasoline that we purchase at the pump. That's uh, an obvious example. Uh, another example is to impose tax on specific, specifically on, on specific uh, uh, agricultural, agricultural products like beef, okay, replacing carbon tax 
on agriculture activities by uh, a tax on the, the product that are generated by those technologies. Beef, we know that uh, uh, 25 kilograms of beef uh, generate one ton of CO2, so it's easy to uh, transform the price of CO2 uh, on, 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 in one economy like Europe uh, into uh, a tax on beef and, and uh, uh, allowing farmers not to have to purchase those carbon permit on the market. Let me stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> of, course, of course, the list of issues is getting longer and longer, so <laughs> many things to think about, but I would now move to our next guest, uh, Madhu Khan. Let's first check if the system works. Can you hear us and can you speak? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, apparently everything is fine, which is sounds strange, but that's good, very good. Um, Madhu is at University of Illinois, uh, uh, issues um, of research, natural resource and environmental economics. And I, I read online that you're working a lot with the motivations for producers to adopt innovative technologies, which is another big issue behind the topic today. So please, the floor is yours for your contribution. Okay, thank, thank you. Thanks so much for the opportunity to talk today. Um, I'm actually calling from India and sorry, I cannot be there. Um, I'm keeping my camera off just to preserve bandwidth and hopefully uh, you know uh, this this will this will work up so so thanks thanks for the invitation um, and you know enjoyed the previous two talks uh, basically just wanted to pick up on that and talk about you know the the role for innovation in meeting our food and and fuel needs in a more sustainable way um, in, you know the need for innovations, gets particularly highlighted when we have uh, crises like the one that we have right now, where uh, because of a, uh, a conflict, um, you know, the current conflict between Russia and Ukraine, both the food and the fuel supplies have been disrupted. And as a result of that, we are in a situation where, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing uh, soaring prices for uh, food, uh, food and food crops, as well as uh, soaring prices for for uh, oil and gas, and um, and so the the uh, you know the the uh, question that arises is you know what is what is the short term response to the crisis, and then what is the long term response that we need to be thinking about um, so that we are we have a more resilient economic and environmental system uh, in light of of our dependence on. Uh, countries that can be unstable and um, um, uh, and uh, and our sort of need need for meeting our our needs, and and so the current crisis you know raises um, this question about uh, the uh, the role that that biofuels in particular uh, are playing and and should be playing in the future as we think about meeting our fuel needs and and. It's raised questions about whether uh, diverting food crops for uh, the, the current system where we are using food crops for biofuels is actually exacerbating the impacts of the current crisis uh, for food prices and the availability of food for consumption. Um, and uh, and whether um, you know reducing that dependence, uh, re reducing that diversion would mitigate, mit mitigate the problem. Um, the second issue that comes up when crop prices begin to rise in addition to its implications for food security is what is the impact that it has on ecosystem services because when crop prices are high there are concerns that it's going to lead to an expansion of crop production on on land which would otherwise be under uh, you know natural conditions or grasslands and so this can have an impact on ecosystem services um, and then the third question that comes up is, you know, how do we balance short-term responses to current crises versus long-term strategies for mitigating climate change? Uh, and, uh, and how do we kind of continue a path for innovation when there are these short-term crises that can actually divert us from, from a long-term path of innovation? So, so those are some of the questions that, that come up and, uh, you know, I'll try to to tackle uh, a few of these issues. Um, 
just to sort of put in perspective, you know, uh, as we look at um, uh, at least in the so you know biofuel production has been has been increasing worldwide and in particular in in the U.S. you know about thirty to forty percent of corn and soybeans are are used to produce um, corn ethanol or or biodiesel. Um, if you look globally, however, only about ten percent of the world grain production is used for for biofuel production, and. Um, you know, um, and and a large part of the the world grain production goes into produce animal feed. Uh, that you know, uh, and, and that has uh, you know, and and a part of the biofuels also generates these co-products that are used for um, animal feed. That um, and so out of the total amount that is used for biofuels, at least a third of it really comes back in the form of, of animal feed. But um, you know the the question is you know what would a sh would a short term reduction in biofuel mandates um, globally would that really have a major impact on food prices in the current context sort of an immediate impact and and um, you know most of the the current thinking is that really um, you know uh, it's it's really unlikely that even if we were to waive the mandates for example in in the U S right now for say corn ethanol, um, it would have much of an impact uh, because currently, uh, you know, a large part of the ethanol is really used because it's a low, low cost source for octane for gasoline. And it's, a, it's um, and so, it, so irrespective of biofuel mandates, the uh, oil industry uses et uh, ethanol to meet its octane requirements. Uh, which will continue to be the case even if the mandates were to be waived and with high oil prices you know ethanol is extremely competitive um and so that's the other reason um also you know in terms of even if um you know cr uh, the food crop prices went down its overall impact on inflation might be relatively small because food crop prices are a small percentage 10 to 15 percent of the the price that consumers ultimately pay in the grocery store so um, you know, so short run impacts of waiving mandates uh, are uh, unlikely to to really uh, have an immediate benefit. Um, and uh, and so I think it's important in this context to to take a long term perspective of what is, you know, the the contributions of biofuels to uh, crop prices and and um, uh, and to land use. And then what can we be doing to think about for meeting food and fuel needs sustainably as we go forward? Um, and so in, in that context, I just want to talk briefly about some of the lessons that we have learned from uh, similar crises that have happened in the past, you know, during the era that biofuels have been, uh, you know, increasingly being used. And what are some of the uh, findings and, and evidence that we have obtained from that that can help to help us to think about the future? Uh, and so, biofuel production really ramped up after two thousand seven uh, in the U.S. and globally, and um, you know, it was immediately followed in two thousand and eight and two thousand and twelve with really sharp increases in the price of uh, uh, crops, as well as accompanying uh, increase in the prices of price of oil for various reasons. But but the two things happened uh, simultaneously, uh, uh, you know, over that time period. Um, but then since and, and again, the same issues had come up at that point in terms of whether, you know, to what extent was the increase in crop prices caused by biofuels. And uh, was that the appropriate, uh, you know, was is that an appropriate policy to have, given the fact that it competes with food food production? But what we've sort of seen over time in the last 10, uh, 15 years is that um, the agricultural sector was has been able to respond to this increased demand for uh, uh, an agricultural product, you know, feedstock for for producing biofuels, and over time, crop prices have significantly decreased. And in fact, despite the fact that biofuel production uh, has continued to go up and in, and in the US has almost doubled since uh, 2007. But, uh, you know, prior to the pandemic, the crop prices had come down to levels similar to 2007 in real terms. And, um, and similarly, if we uh, so, you know, which which indicates that Agriculture has significant capacity to innovate and uh, and 
what we observed is that the higher crop prices, and there is I mean, empirical evidence to support it, that higher crop prices uh, stimulated more intensive use of land, uh, as a result of which yield uh, per acre has grown uh, you know, much great at much faster rates than it had historically, and and um, you know, corn yields in particular have been have increased at much higher rates than had been observed previously in the last decade or so, uh, and and in fact that increased the capacity of agriculture to meet its increased demand. Um, and and um, the other uh, and and so as a result, the need for additional acreage um, went down. The second thing that that also we've learned from from uh, past experience is that overall the the uh, response of land uh, and acreage, cropland acreage to crop prices is fairly small. Land you know um, uh, land use is rather inelastic to crop prices, and so even when crop prices go up a lot actually cropland expansion is relatively small. And so, uh, and the, the, uh, what we observe more is that there is increased in intensity of crop production. So there's more double cropping, there is better use of the land to produce uh, you know, crops rather than an expansion of land. And so some of the, the concerns that, have, that had originally been raised with biofuels about it leading to expansion of cropland and, and this indirect land use change and release of carbon emissions has not really been borne out uh, from the actual observed um, evidence. And in fact, even more, the later models also simulating these indirect land use change effects of biofuels are finding that the effects are much smaller than they had been. They're a fraction of what had been originally, um, you know, uh, forecasted by these models. Uh, but nevertheless, the uh, the other thing that, you know, our current crisis kind of uh, brings uh, to the forefront is the need for uh, two things. One is to continue to make efforts to reduce dependence on fossil fuels, particularly imports from countries that are politically unstable. We need, you know, there is this, we need, uh, you know, greater energy security, which comes in part by increasing our uh, dependence on uh, renewable resources that are locally uh, uh, available and can both mitigate climate change as well as provide energy security. And, and, in, and to do so by, by not relying as much on food crops, but in, instead moving on to non-food crops for biofuel production. And so uh, we, and there's been a lot of research in the last two decades, which has, which has shown that, you know, we know how to be able to produce these uh, uh, advanced or cellulosic biofuels from non-food crops. And it's really a matter of, you know, investing in it and commercializing those technologies so that we can have large scale uh, production. But um, it, yeah, but there we know that there are crops, high yielding non food crops, energy crops, uh, you know, is like miscanthus and switchgrass and others that can be produced on low quality land with less need to divert prime crop land. Um, and that these crops can also provide other ecosystem services like carbon sequestration, reducing nitrogen runoff, and so on that are uh, can mitigate some of the current challenges with uh, the environmental impacts with the conventional crop production that we currently have. However, uh, in order to induce uh, the investments that are needed for scaling up and commercialization, uh, we need to have stable and credible policies, and, and these need to be uh, maintained uh, for, a, for a long period of time, uh, as we've observed, even with first generation biofuels, it, it has taken you know, decades um, and significant policy support to actually make these first generation biofuels competitive and to now be at a stage where they can be supported, uh, you know, they're competitive with oil. Uh, so the, the um, you know, the challenge we face is that these short term crises, which, which um, you know, call for uh, waiving current policies and so on can actually have a really disruptive effect on, on incentives for long term innovation to move, move from the first generation to second generation biofuels and, and the uncertainty that gets created, um, uh, you know, can uh, significantly deter investment. Um, and um, 
and so, and so and then the other aspect that also sort of brought up by the previous speaker is that you know we need to have a portfolio approach as we think about um, how do we meet our needs for transportation fuel and decarbonization um, in a way that is sustainable and uh, you know, currently there's a lot of interest in, uh, you know, most people would sort of uh, say, well, you know, instead of biofuels, we could have electrification of the transportation sector. Uh, and if we do that, we will not have to make these choices between food and, and fuel. Um, so, uh, you know, so in order to do that, of course, you know, we have to uh, increase renewable energy and generation because uh, continuing to rely upon coal, uh, would not be as effective, uh, if, even if we were to electrify, electrify the fleet. Uh, some of that uh, moving away to, to solar and wind, uh, you know, is a great idea. But as we think about expanding solar generation, there is also, um, you know, and we move, we have to move away from rooftop solar to, to ground solar, utility scale solar. And there it also begins to compete for cropland. So we don't completely escape the food versus fuel issue, even with solar energy as we expand that. Um, the other uh, aspect to keep in mind is that the current share of electric vehicles is less than 5% globally. Um, it, it's large in China but, and, and in uh, Europe, but even in the, in the US, it's actually only about 3% or so. And, uh, you know, in order to get to the two degree, uh, keeping, you know, to net zero and, and keeping to within the two degree uh, scenario, we need to be able to expand uh, electric vehicles to 60 percent uh, share in, in sales, um, you know, by 2030, uh, which is a significant uh, ramp up that, um, you know, is, is uh, would be extremely costly and unlikely to be something that consumers would be uh, ready to adopt. And we've been looking at some of that, and and it, and given the current, even with very uh, optimistic uh, expectations about costs of electric vehicles coming down and so on that's a target that is unlikely to be met so but even if we were to meet it I and mean, even if we get to to you know uh 30 percent share in in our fleet of um uh, having electric vehicles uh 70 percent is still going to be conventional vehicles and that are going to need liquid fuels and so uh, even in then having low carbon biofuels that are not dependent on food crops would make a significant dent in, in reducing uh, carbon um, emissions. And so uh, I think, uh, you know, I just sort of want to conclude by saying that in, in the short run, it's unlikely that, you know, modifying biofuel policies would have much of an impact on mitigating the current food shortage, shortages. Um, and we need to be thinking long term on what uh, the role that biofuels uh, can play and what type of biofuels we want to be able to promote. And uh, recognizing the importance of second generation biofuels, also then uh, uh, keep in mind that, you know, waivable biofuel policies create a lot of uncertainty for investment and they deter this transition to second generation biofuels. Um, so in the long run, mitigating food and fuel competition requires uh, innovation to transition to non-food crop uh, biofuels. And also, uh, you know, look at the way that we meet our current needs for, for food production. Um, you know, there's a lot of inefficiency in the way that we are currently producing our food crops. Yield, there's significant potential to increase yields across the world and free up land that could be used for biofuels. Um, as well as looking at, you know, uh, how we can change diets from livestock to plant-based products that could make us um, get more calories from the current land, uh, uh, land base. And then lastly, uh, that electrification alone is unlikely to lead to decarbonization of the transportation sector in the medium term without low carbon biofuels. And, in, and even in the long run, um, you know, when it comes to aviation and marine, marine uh, transportation, it is, um, you know, for a long time, we can anticipate that we would be needing liquid fuels. And that, those are areas where biofuels can, can uh, play a, a role in, in particular. So uh, let, I'll stop with that and, and uh, happy to take questions at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat>